just finished watching an award-winning French film. This film starred an 11-year-old girl. Within the run of the film, she dressed in attire not suitable for her age. She danced provocatively. She attempted to seduce a grown man and ultimately found herself overwhelmed by her choices to the point where she fled from the adult world and attempted to re-embrace her childhood innocence. As an early effort for a writer-director, I found it impressive, well-made, and forward-thinking. Yes, I did watch Mignon's, the French film better known as Cuties, thanks to streaming distribution via Netflix, but that's actually not the film I'm talking about. We'll get to the film that I'm talking about later, though I'm sure many of you are already well aware of which film I described moments ago. I like to do my own thing. But with so much talk and judgment going on for a film that many admittedly have not seen, I felt compelled to reserve judgment prior to seeing the film for myself. And I'm not going to bury the lead here. Netflix owes Memuno Ducure an apology. Ami is an 11-year-old girl attempting to process multiple transitions in her life. Parental-like responsibilities for her two younger siblings A mother forced to sacrifice time with her children due to the long work hours needed to provide for her family. A father intent on marrying a new woman and taking residence in the apartment with his old family and the onset of womanhood. With so much turmoil in her personal life and no internal connection to her religious upbringing, Ami seeks solace in friendship. She soon discovers it via classmates Angie and the Cuties a group of rebellious dancers that mimic local dance groups consisting of teenagers and young women. As Ami dives headlong into a world far beyond her innocent years, the litany of personal problems are externalized under her new friends, shattering all of their innocence and holding up a very damning mirror to Ami. Ducure's film had a very successful and respectable film festival run capped by a dramatic directing award at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. The film also received international critical acclaim, including a four-star review from Monica Castillo with perhaps the most appropriate quote I've seen in regards to Cuties. Controversy aside, Cuties is a difficult and challenging film, pushing the idea of depiction does not equal endorsement to its limit. It's hard to set the controversy aside, but I feel that none of the fault lies at the feet of Ducare. This blame, in my opinion, can be placed squarely at the feet of Netflix, who set aside a nuanced promotional poster that depicted one of the more symbolic scenes for the film, instead choosing to opt for one of their more stock-style posters that just so happened to exploit the young stars and cuties in the exact same manner that the film condemns. In the era of cancel culture, where outrage is now and the target changes on a near daily basis, it's not surprising that a movement to boycott Netflix emerged quickly for their exploitation of the young women in cubes. With horror stories of exploited young girls, overzealous dance moms, inappropriate media, and child trafficking abound, why would Netflix choose to endorse media that is clearly so exploited? Think pieces, takedown tweets, and YouTube videos galore listed the lewd elements of the film that exploit the star. An exposed bare breasts, an attempt to film a young man in the bathroom, exposed underwear, a cell phone picture of private parts, and overall costuming and dancing were the main culprits. What is absent from much of the talk about the film, however, is the simple fact that the film is a bold, brash condemnation of how young women are sexualized and how dangerous access to questionable media can be for young and impressionable minds. Many details are left out. The exposed breast belongs to a young adult. The bathroom filming is unsuccessful and exposes no body parts. The underwear scene takes place during a fight that the main character instigates and the cell phone scene exposes no body parts. All of these aspects fit squarely within the flow of the narrative make complete sense in the context of the film and serve purposes that propel the narrative forward. As for the costuming and the dancing, this aspect is done in a manner that makes the viewer feel like Alex from A Clockwork Orange when he's subjected to the Ludovico technique. It is meant to make the viewer uncomfortable. It is harshly rejected by the majority of those that experience it within the world of the film 
and the validation that the young girls find in their actions is heavily outweighed by the issues it causes them. Now, I'm not completely unaware of the fact that some people just don't want to see young women exploited on the screen, be it with the intent of teaching a lesson or not. All of the discussion and backlash, however, got me to thinking about my past experiences with the films I've seen. And if there was something comparable to Cuties in terms of the age of the lead actress and the way she was presented on film. Ironically, I didn't even have to step outside the realm of French film to find another example, and one that is generally loved by critics and consumers alike. This will be the film I described earlier. Matilda is a 12-year-old girl struggling to maintain her sense of worth and sanity in a severely broken home. Her father is a low-level drug dealer, her stepmother sees her as a burden, and her half-sister despises her. The only saving graces for Matilda are her innocent younger brother and her curiosity about her mysterious and quiet neighbor down the hall. Matilda offers to buy her neighbor the milk he purchases on a near-daily basis and by sheer luck, the errand leads her out of the line of fire of crooked DEA agents that slaughter her entire family over her father's poor drug deal. Shattered and scarred for life, Matilda seeks shelter with her neighbor, a professional cleaner named Leon. With the need for revenge burned into her soul, Matilda attempts to use Leon to exact revenge on the DEA agents, and in the process, a deep bond is formed between the two. To my recollection, this film is universally loved and adored. What began as a soft sequel to La Femme Nikita and a holdover until production for The Fifth Element could start, became a breakout moment for director Luc Besson, as well as stars Natalie Portman and Gary Oldman. Critics lauded the performance and style, and Leon's commercial success was undeniable, with box office earnings nearly tripling that of the film's budget. At the time of the film's release, the topic of Natalie Portman's age certainly was not ignored. My parents are like, there is no way you're doing this movie. This is absolutely inappropriate for a child your age to be doing this film. And I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever read. You're going to ruin my life. And was basically just fighting with them so much. The sexual undertones or overtones of the film were also things that my parents tried to scale down. In the original script, there was a scene where Matilda was in the shower, and Leon sort of walked in by accident and, you know, gave her a towel, and she was like, I don't care, or whatever. And, um, so that was clearly acts. I think that when you're 11 and you're reading I Love You, I mean, there's not too many ways to, to interpret that. There's not, I mean, I personally didn't have a real you know, sexual understanding at that point at all. So the I love you was very, very innocent. And obviously, Matilda's a girl who comes from a place where, I mean, you see her see sex in the beginning of the film. So it's not something she's unfamiliar with or, you know, she's not a stranger to sexuality and clearly has these sort of instincts within her. Um, but it's, it's a very, I mean, it's a very pure sort of, thing in the film, you know, it doesn't cross that line, it's just these two people who are so alone and happen to find each other within this sort of graveyard. That was like the beginning of my acting school, which, you know, I was lucky enough to continue, you know, through my teens and now into my 20s, and it's just been this sort of like prolonged learning experience that was started off with, you know, the ultimate experience. And it was also great because it started me out, you know, when you start out as a kid, a lot of people end up in kid movies. And by starting out as an adult in a film for grown-ups, I think it eased my transition into adult acting more because people have been looking at me as like a woman sort of since I was a little girl. But it's sort of been, sort of allowed me to have sort of one stream that there wasn't really like a bump going into adult film roles. A recently shocking revelation about the relationship depicted in The Professional was how closely it mirrored the real-life relationship of director Luc Besson and his second wife, Maywen Lebesco, who played a minor role in The Professional and portrayed the memorable diva Plava Laguna in The Fifth Element. Besson and Lebesco began dating in 1992, when Besson was 31 and Lebesco was 15 
but the pair actually met and became friends four years prior. The parallels between this relationship and the one portrayed in The Professional are hard to ignore, and Labesco has actually claimed that the relationship was the direct inspiration for the film. As time moved on, however, life experiences were shaped Natalie Portman's memories of the experience, as she famously shared at the 2018 Women's March. Let me tell you about my own experience. I turned 12 on the set of my first film, The Professional, in which I played a young girl who befriends a hitman and hopes to avenge the murder of her family. The character is simultaneously discovering and developing her womanhood, her voice, and her desire. At that moment in my life, I too was discovering my own womanhood, my own desire, and my own voice. I was so excited at 13 when the film was released and my work and my art would have a human response. I excitedly opened my first fan mail to read a rape fantasy that a man had written me. A countdown was started on my local radio show to my 18th birthday, euphemistically the date that I would be legal to sleep with. Movie reviewers talked about my budding breasts in reviews. I understood very quickly, even as a 13-year-old, that if I were to express myself sexually, I would feel unsafe, and that men would feel entitled to discuss and objectify my body to my great discomfort. So I quickly adjusted my behavior. I rejected any role that even had a kissing scene and talked about that choice deliberately in interviews. I emphasized how bookish I was and how serious I was, and I cultivated elegant way of dressing. I built a reputation for basically being prudish, conservative, nerdy, serious, in an attempt to feel that my body was safe and that my voice would be listened to. At 13 years old, the message from our culture was clear to me. I felt the need to cover my body and to inhibit my expression and my work in order to send my own message to the world that I'm someone worthy of safety and respect. The response to my expression, from small comments about my body to more threatening, deliberate statements, served to control my behavior through an environment of sexual terrorism. A world in which I could wear whatever I want, say whatever I want, and express my desire however I want, without fearing for my physical safety or reputation, that would be the world in which female desire and sexuality could have its greatest expression and fulfillment. That world we want to build is the opposite of puritanical. So I'd like to propose one way to continue moving this revolution forward. Let's declare loud and clear, this is what I want. This is what I need. This is what I desire. This is how you can help me achieve pleasure. To people of all genders here with us today, let's find a space where we mutually, consensually look out for each other's pleasure and allow the vast, limitless range of desire to be expressed. Let's make a revolution of desire. Perhaps it is the revelation of experience such as this that would inspire a young woman to dedicate her directorial debut towards rectifying the issues of female objectification and sexualization especially when it is inflicted upon the youth. Perhaps a film like Cuties is supposed to be a key point in the revolution of desire that will bring representative quality to not only the arts, but eventually the culture at large. Perhaps it's best to let Maimouna Dupere speak on her own intentions for making the film. Cuties is a deeply feminist film with an activist message. We must all together to figure out what is the best for our children. As a director, as an artist, I'm doing my part with this film. Politicians, the education system, parents, children. I think all together we have to fix what's gone wrong so we can give the most beautiful space to our girls and boys to grow up safely and become the best version of themselves. My film Cuties is a mirror of today's society. A mirror sometimes difficult to look into and accept, but still so true. We can blame our children for what we value in our society. I hope that people can become 11 years old during an hour and a half of cuties in our world. In many ways, Amy is navigating her way in three cultures. Her family, French Western culture, and this hyper-real fiction of social media. <sighs> yeah. 
try to experience how difficult and confusing it must be to grow up and find yourself in this triple culture. Thank you for tuning in to Doom on Film. It's understandable if you're uncomfortable with what is portrayed in Cuties, but any criticism of the film should be done in earnest. If you're curious about the film, give it a watch and formulate your own opinion. If you're appalled by the idea of it, don't watch it. To feed a film like this to the cancel culture, however, is a major disservice towards a piece of artistic expression created solely in hopes of rectifying the issues it has found itself condemned for.